Okay, terrific. Uh, thank you all for coming, uh, both in person and virtually. Uh, I'm Ed Lee, uh, the author of a book, uh, Creators Take Control, and I will be sharing with you uh, some thoughts from uh, my book, which is uh, on sale now. Now, to start out with today's talk, I thought it would be helpful to begin with a little bit of a lesson from history. At the start of the 20th century, there was a threat, or at least a perceived threat. The New York Times editorial uh, characterized this threat in the following way. This movement is surely a part of the general movement discernible all over the world to disrupt and degrade, if not destroy, not only art, but society. Now, what was this threat to society? Well, it was not AI, rest assured. It was art, a new approach to art. This threat was perceived to be so serious that the students of the Art Institute of Chicago, right down the street, Michigan Avenue, organized a mass protest and a mock trial, charging an artist with artistic murder and a jury in this mock trial convicted the artist as charged and sentenced the artist to death. Now, who was this artist? Well, it was an artist that we know today as Matisse. And that may be surprising today, but uh, back then uh, things were considered to be um, a radical threat to society. So the doctors in the United States weighed in on this threat and some of the leading physicians in the United States provided the imprimatur of medicine to say, yes, this was really a threat. So here's Dr. Francis Durkham, the top neurologist, one of the top neurologists yeah, of the yeah, time. Well, yes. <laughs> Could you, yes, thank you. One of the top neurologists of the United States, he has a disease that named after him that he diagnosed he said this to the Washington Times, I will say that the drawings of insane artists are far superior to the alleged works of art I saw at the exhibition. This was reported in the Washington Times quoting other physicians as well who agreed that this was a product of mental illness, this new form of art, the freak fads of modern painting. The Times suggested that we should consider quarantining the studios of these artists, kind of fitting for our days of the post pandemic, quarantine the studios of these artists and consider amending the constitution. There goes the freedom of speech. Now, the Times also reported an anonymous pamphlet that had circulated at the time of an exhibition at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, one of the first for modern art, characterizing the art as the product of a modernistic degenerate cult, the worshipers of Satan, the God of ugliness. And that was widely circulating at the time of this exhibition. The New York Times even called these artists freaks and that was apparently a common label that was used to describe uh, these artists. And you may ask yourself today, well, what was so disturbing about Matisse and other artists trying to transform art into this modern approach. Well, the main initiator, the instigator that agitated people so much was Cubism. And there's the representation of Cubism. Uh, what Cubism did was effectuate a radical shift, a shift from a linear perspective, a single point perspective into multiple perspectives that were likened to fragments or cubes. So the shift went from a linear perspective of the Italian Renaissance, what you would see in this painting that might look like the representation that you see out of a photograph into these cubes in A Girl with a Mandolin by Picasso that represents manifold perspectives in one representation. And it's a manifold representation, not just of the painter, but of the viewer. That was the modern approach that these artists were trying to usher in. So this was an obliteration of artistic 
conventions, basically, to borrow a line from the matrix, free your mind. And that's why it was considered to be so radical that it led to these protests in the United States and also in other countries. This was considered to be a radical disruption to artistic convention. And it faced, this is a part that I think has often been lost with uh, our exposure to modern and contemporary art, decades of backlash, not just in the United States, but in other parts of the world. Tragically, this was picked up, this notion of degenerate art was picked up by Nazi Germany and the uh, Nazis confiscated tens of thousands of modern artworks, sold many of them to fund World War II, their effort. Now we know that ultimately cubism prevailed and modern art we now have and contemporary art, et cetera. Uh, but it came at this tragic cost when the view that this was degenerate really circulated in the United States and other countries. And it led to uh, the confiscation as we saw uh, by Nazi Germany. Ultimately, the cubist approach was, is considered one of the most influential movements in the 20th century, because what it did was to obliterate artistic convention and eventually artists realized they did not even have to stick to a cubist approach. Picasso did not stick to a cubist approach. The whole point was to free yourself from convention. And there is Picasso, undoubtedly one of the most important artists of the 20th century, if not in history. Uh, and, and he is one of the co-founders of this cubist style of approach. Now, this brief page of history can help us navigate the 21st century in the, this first quarter, when there has been also a perceived threat that has been described by the media, these are direct quotes, a giant Ponzi scheme, a scam, a grift, a cult, ugly, hideous, a crime against humanity. Now, what is this threat to society? Well, it's something called this NFT, a non-fungible token, which really is, if you study it, it is a computer program that is stored on blockchain that has not caused any mass protests yet, but there has been a mock protest at the 2022 NFT NYC conference that I attended. Uh, Bobby Hundreds organized this mock protest and yes, God does hate NFTs. Now, you might ask yourself, why has there been this backlash in the media for this computer program? Normally, that doesn't spark such a reaction. Well, the reason is very simple, I argue in the book. It has effectuated a radical shift in our understanding of ownership. This is great to be in a law setting. We all know property law, intellectual property law. We understand the concept of exclusive rights. What NFTs do is establish ownership through virtual tokens. They aren't really tokens, they're just lines of code. And that's the tricky part is like, really? Uh, people don't understand, well, you can have ownership through lines of code. Yes, you can. I think it's been proven in the past two years. I describe this movement as capital T tokenism, not to be confused with the conventional understanding of tokenism, little t tokenism, capital T tokenism, which I liken to the cubist movement at the turn of the 20th century. But instead of a change in perspective, we are now changing how things can be owned. They can be owned virtually. And not surprisingly, this exploded during the pandemic when you know, the world was forced to go virtual for many interactions. Now, is this a threat? No, this is not a threat. This, what this did was to create a market, a new market for especially digital art that had not existed before. It had not existed before because the problem with the digital artwork is there is no original. Each copy of a digital artwork is basically the same. So if uh, a digital artist sells one copy of the digital artwork, then the owner of that copy 
will not be able to retain the, you know, any value in it because it could be infinitely copied by anyone else who sees the artist's website. And artists need to show their works because then they can't, otherwise they can't be discovered, right? They can't sell their works without showing it to the world. That's the problem that NFTs solve by creating essentially this virtual original. There's a unique token that represents the one original for this digital artwork. Now, I will share today with you the story of an independent artist who branched out to NFTs. In the book, I discuss more. Uh, these are examples of artists who have suddenly found the way to sustain their artistic pursuits. March, 2020, do you remember where you were? You remember where you were? Yeah, it seems so long ago, right? It seems so long ago, and yet it seems like it just happened, like we are still living a part of this. In that month, New York City was the epicenter of COVID in the United States. It went into lockdown uh, shortly after California. Laura L. was not even a full-time artist at the time. She held many odd jobs and she was discouraged by her family, her friends, her colleagues from not trying to pursue art, which was her passion because there was no way she could make it, make a living as an artist. So she listened to those negative uh, recommendations to avoid trying to pursue art. But at this time when the world was going uh, into lockdown, she decided uh, she wanted to uh, change the tone of the discussion uh, on social media. And she said this, she posted this on her Instagram and she was, she had very few followers at the time. She said, social media is flooded with negativity. Everybody is in a panic mode. We probably all could remember that feeling. I wanted to somehow positively impact people. We are in this together. I'm giving away my custom pet illustrations. You want it, you got it, I will be waiting. And we can't forget the emoji, hard symbol. Now, because she didn't have that many followers, you know, she thought she would only get a few, but it turned out this post went viral as some posts do on social media. And over the next three weeks, she sketched over 1,200 pet sketches from people around the world, pet owners, uh, and including some healthcare workers who were working on the front lines battling with COVID infections, uh, those afflicted with COVID inf infections. And she wrote approximately, or drew approximately 60 sketches a day and helped to raise over $12,000 in donations for New York City uh, anima animal shelters during the start of the lockdown period. Now, this episode for her turned out to be the spark for her creativity, that she decided that in lockdown, she would pursue art full time. And this turned out to be a common story I heard from other independent artists who now were suddenly in lockdown and had all this time on their hands. What are you gonna do? Well, their response, I'm going to create. I'm going to you know, create uh, new works, you know, pursue my passions during lockdown. And Laura L, uh, eventually, after following the discussion on social media, which is the way that most artists learned about NFTs, seeing what other artists did, she decided to create her own set of 23 NFTs called the Lurkers. And the Lurkers are the evil forces in the world represented in the dark. And by the end of this story, the Lurkers will be, will be converted to the positive. Uh, through children and through pets, to see the color in the world and the positivity and good that people have. Now, this was her first NFT project. It earned over $200,000 in sales. It was one of the most successful projects at the time on one of the marketplaces called Exchange Art. And just last month, Sotheby's auctioned one of her NFTs for over $10,000. Now, mind you, this was an artist who two years ago was selling pet sketches for $10 or less. She even told me that she would be nickel and dimed 
by people who wanted to buy her pet sketches for under $10. But the NFT market has invited art investors and collectors to purchase these artworks that are you know, unique because of the NFT. Now, if this were the only story I had to tell it to you today, I think it would be a tremendous inspirational story of this independent artist who made it uh, and found her passion and calling through this new technology. But it's not the only success story. In fact, there are many artists discussed in my book and also not discussed in my book, but who are successful around the world. This is a global phenomenon where digital artists especially suddenly have a market where people are investing in their works. So it has been life-changing for so many artists uh, who never had this opportunity before. It has changed the narrative from, unfortunately, this romantic figure of the starving artist, uh, goes back to Puccini and La Boheme, to a thriving artist where the artist can pursue this full time and sustain themselves uh, through NFTs. And in two or three years of this NFT market, uh, I think it, the evidence is clear this is better than the status quo how we treated artists before. In the traditional art world, there are gatekeepers, museums, galleries, auction houses. If you are not permitted in that past the gates, you will not make it as an artist. Uh, who is left out if you are not uh, accepted by the gatekeepers? Well, we have empirical studies to show us who is left out. My guess is that you probably have a hunch who is left out from the traditional art world. Okay, the leading study out there uh, by Bocart and others looked at auction houses. Over a million works sold at auction to, from 2000 to 2017. Unfortunately, less than 4% of those works were by women artists. Really a staggering figure, right? That's the traditional gatekeeping function. What about museums in the United States? The top museums in the United States, studied by Tupaz and others at Williams College. Well, it turns out 85% of the artworks in the permanent collections of the top museums are by white artists, predominantly men. In addition, in terms of the gatekeeping function, the galleries typically get 50% of every sale of an artwork that they promote. So just imagine in your current jobs or your future jobs, you would have to give 50% back to your employer or your, the law firm, what have you, there's a, there's a gatekeeper. How, how would you survive if 50% of your paycheck is going to an intermediary? Now, what NFTs have shown in basically two years is that we do not need galleries. We don't need the gatekeepers. That's just to see if you're still awake. Uh, we don't need the gatekeepers. The artists can keep 100% of their revenue minus any modest nominal amount for a decentralized marketplace. The figure typically is 2.5%. Some are doing 0%. In addition, here is the kicker. The artists can get resale royalties, what is commonly called creator royalties in the NFT space. Resale royalties are not a new idea. It's called droit de suite in France, in French, uh, which originated this concept under copyright law. Visual artists get a royalty for every resale of their original painting, let's say. Uh, what NFT creators have done is created a contractual resale royalty right that enables resale uh, royalties for each uh, sale of an NFT. In one year, $1.5 billion in royalties went back to artists. One year. Now, this was the boom year, 2021. Uh, and in, since 2022, things have uh, sort of tapered off in this what's called a crypto winter. The macroeconomic conditions uh, generally are bad. But we know the potential is there from this one year. So just listen to a few of the artists who are some of the key figures in this uh, digital art field. 
Tyler Hobbs, one of the most successful uh, artists, he's represented by Pace Gallery now, one of the top galleries. Um, but he didn't even need that before he became successful. He said royalties, one of the single largest positive shifts that NFTs have opened up for artists. It just makes a difference in the lives of artists and how much opportunity an artist has to support themselves through their work. Claire Silver, an AI artist. Now, AI is all the rage today. Uh, AI art is exploding. She was one of the early ones who really started experimenting with AI. She said this is probably the single most impactful change Web3 has given artists. It's generational transformation and it's fair. Ferocious, another one of the top artists in the NFT space said this, royalties, and this is handwritten, uh, royalties were the reason the art community flocked to NFTs in the first place. A new democratization of art, no gatekeepers, a new world where artists finally found a way to get paid from their works on an ongoing basis. We know this is spurring artistic creations because artists can sustain themselves, especially during uh, bad economic times. So the lesson of the past couple of years shows that if we invest in artists in the creative sectors, not just in the visual arts, there are platforms now where you can invest in independent musicians. Independent filmmakers have already produced movies for their films, including Julie, uh, Julie Pacino and Miguel Faust, really successful films. Uh, this is a way for all of us potentially to consider being 21st century patrons, going back to the days of the Renaissance. Now, you may ask yourself, okay, there's bad economy. Um, why would we even wanna do this? There's so many other problems. Why are we even focusing on this today? Well, let me offer you this reason, a very practical reason, is that when we invest in the arts, we are not just investing in artists, we are investing in society and ourselves. Because the studies show, there are hundreds of studies that show this, there are so many societal benefits to exposure to art. So the first, in a time, especially you know, during this pandemic or post-pandemic, uh, mental illness is on the rise, anxiety, depression, et cetera. There are studies that show uh, art can be used in therapy to help counteract depression, anxiety. Uh, so that reason alone would be, I think, a reason for us to start committing more to the development of artists and their ability to create art. But there are other studies that show a high correlation with exposure to art and greater toleration for other people, greater compassion for other people, and more civic mindedness. And in the days of you know, intense political polarization, all of these virtues would be valuable, I think, to society. Uh, now, we don't need these studies to really understand why we need art and why humans need art in the first place. We already know this. Uh, there was a survey done in 2019 of Americans. And here are some of the results from this survey. Pretty, you know, I think uh, one-sided and impressive in showing that we already know the value of art. 90% of those surveyed said art broadens the mind. 91% said art is vital to education. And 90% said art reduces stress. So those empirical studies that the researchers are doing are confirming, I think, what intuitively we already know. Why do we go to the Art Institute? Why do we go to the uh, Museum of Contemporary Art? Why do we uh, listen to music? Why do we see movies, et cetera? We do it because we know it makes us feel better. There's actually a book out, Your Brain on Art, that goes into uh, some of these studies that document the positive effects of exposure to art. Now, I focused uh, on the first half on how NFTs have really spawned this new market for especially digital artworks. 
But I don't want to give you the wrong impression that NFTs are simply for artists, and that's all they do. Remember that NFTs are just computer programs that establish virtual ownership. So anything that can be owned can be made the subject for an NFTs. Businesses realize that, and they've just begun starting to deploy NFTs in various ways. Uh, and I will uh, share with you a couple of the ways uh, that they are doing this. Um, but uh, we've only scratched the surface of how these NFTs will be incorporated by businesses, especially in this creator economy when there's a lot of uh, sort of called user-generated content, when people are creating uh, TikTok videos, posting things on Facebook, et cetera. Uh, now, this gets into my second theory, which is that NFTs are operating as a form of decentralized intellectual property, or DIP for short. Uh, I think many of us are probably more familiar with uh, cryptocurrency and the movement to try to have decentralized finance, DeFi. I argue that there is something parallel happening with respect to intellectual property. So in our copyright system, Congress and the Copyright Office stands at the center of in, in terms of formulating our copyright laws and policies. Uh, in the world of decentralized intellectual property, uh, instead the creators and businesses are using NFTs and contracts to reconfigure arrangements that are more conducive and flexible to the way that they envision copyrights. Uh, so there's no centralized entity on uh, this side of the screen here with DIP. Instead, we have decentralized marketplaces and a bunch of businesses and individuals tailoring uh, the approach to intellectual property using NFTs and uh, licenses. Uh, so let me point out a, a few of the dimensions in which uh, this operates, this form of decentralized IP. One of the clear shifts is a lot of the projects using NFTs are now granting commercial rights, IP rights, to the owners of the NFTs they are selling. Uh, and this facilitates what I characterize as decentralized collaboration. So to understand this shift, uh, let's look at what would be considered to be a centralized collaboration. Walt Disney. The 20th century success story of centralized collaboration, uh, the Disney studio, uh, that means that Disney controls any licensing of its intellectual property. It's at the center. Uh, this, is, this is the hub and spoke model, and they've done it brilliantly. They are one of the top global brands for licensing and a significant portion, at least a third of their revenues comes from licensing out uh, Mickey Mouse and other characters to other businesses for apparel, uh, et cetera. Now, that's the 20th century success story. What is in the works, but it's only two years old, we'll have to see how big a success story is, is this approach where it's decentralized. And here is the startup company, Yuga Labs, which is valued at $4 billion. It is the top startup right now in NFTs, it owns uh, four or uh, four of the top five uh, NFT projects. Uh, by using NFTs plus a copyright license that comes with the NFT, whoever buys the NFT gets this license, commercial license. The owner of the NFT could monetize the artwork that comes with the NFT. So just to take one example, there are many examples. I mean, I think there are hundreds of a uh, hundred business businesses or more that have developed based on this approach here. Uh, Snoop Dogg purchased one of these NFTs and he used the character, which he named Dr. Bombay to be the front figure for his ice cream brand, Dr. Bombay, uh, Dr. Bombay's uh, sweet uh, exploration. Uh, there. So that's an example of wh where the, anybody who purchases the NFT can decide how to monetize the artwork associated with this. In a separate study that I didn't have a chance to mention in the book, 
looking at the top 25 NFT projects, over 60% of them have used a commercial license granting such rights. This would have never happened in the 20th century, right? All rights reserved in Disney's approach, centralized collaboration is the model. 21st century, we're seeing this experimentation and we'll have to see how this pans out, right? It's still very early, but it is very promising for this industry leader, uh, Yuga Labs. Another major development for decentralized intellectual property, and this is one of the uses of NFTs that maybe has been underreported, is the ability to interact with the owner of the NFT and the business. This reimagines the relationship between business and consumer. And it becomes business and their community. And we're going to interact with our community and engage them. Uh, so let's take an example of this. How many people have heard of the Starbucks NFTs? Maybe one or two. It's sort of under the radar, but it's, it's very successful. They actually have a launch today of a second uh, round of NFTs. Uh, they and other businesses are using NFTs for their loyalty rewards programs. So instead of signing up by email, you purchase an NFT or you could be gifted an NFT, uh, depending on what the relationship is. Uh, and through the NFT, the business can continue to interact with you because there can be communications sent, what's called airdropping, to your crypto wallet, which is typically where how uh, NFTs are purchased through uh, the use of cryptocurrency. Uh, so Starbucks has deployed this in an Odyssey's program where the owners of the NFTs are entitled to experiences you know, hosted by Starbucks, whether it's a cultural event, uh, you know, a, a group outing, a you know, coffee uh, break, so to speak. Uh, and as I said, Earlier uh, today, there was another launch for a collectible, uh, a collectible art set of artworks for their first store ever uh, for Starbucks. The other uh, way in which uh, NFTs have already been embraced uh, by um, the athletic and fashion industries is as a form of ownership for digital uh, apparel and digital shoes. Uh, as well as combining that with the entitlement to a physical apparel or physical shoes. It's, the combination is called digital. If you own an NFT, you are entitled to the uh, physical shoe and you're entitled to a digital shoe that can be used, for instance, in, on your avatar in a virtual world. And that is all the rage of, of the fashion industry, like not just athletic, but we're talking about haute couture, like they're developing uh, digital uh, fashion for uses in uh, virtual worlds. Now, this enables this interactiveness, interactive ownership, where now the owners of the NFTs are qualified to receive, for instance, this has just happened today, uh, you know, newsflash, uh, a poster of the Air Force Ones uh, in this new project called R Force One. And that's where you get this community, right? You are re envisioning the relationship between business and customers. So it's a community. And eventually there will be a, a drop or a launch of the virtual uh, Air Force Ones or R Force Ones that could be purchased as NFTs. And here is what uh, Nike has displayed on its marketplace, what's called dot swoosh. That's a clever name. Uh, some of the utility that you get if you own one of these NFTs, you get the ability to have these experiences to use the NFTs in gaming uh, down the road, uh, access to the digital files so that you can build you know, your avatar for these uh, virtual experiences, et cetera. And that is a key, uh, component of NFTs, you know, this notion of utility. Uh, some NFTs are simply the embodiment of virtual ownership for artwork, let's say. Uh, not often, the, it's not often the case where the artworks are coming with added utility expectations that you're going to host them 
for events, it's possible. But what we've seen are that the businesses see the attractiveness of adding the utility to owners uh, as part of the rights that go with ownership of NFTs. Okay, the third major development in this DIP world is a greater permissiveness in allowing people to do remixing of the works. And maybe this shouldn't be surprising because we've already seen a greater permissiveness in granting commercial rights to owners. Uh, but here it is allowing people to play around with the artwork and we're not going to file a DMCA notice to ask, you know, ask the marketplace to take it down, uh, except maybe in some you know, limited circumstances. For example, the top NFT PFP collection, profile picture collection, it's called the CryptoPunks. They are considered the Mona Lisas of uh, NFT projects. The highest uh, sale for one of, of these CryptoPunks, the rare uh, blue alien was $23 million. $23 million for just this virtual uh, blue alien. Well, it turns out once you're successful as a project, everybody else wants to copy your project. It's called copy pasta. And one just occurred recently uh, on Bitcoin blockchain called the Ordal Punks. Uh, and the copyright owner, which now is actually uh, Yuga Labs, uh, did not do anything to stop these derivatives from being sold. And these derivatives uh, of the crypto punks typically sell for much less, but it could be you know, in the low thousands of dollars. I mean, it's not nothing. Uh, and yet the copyright owner is not worried uh, about this, um, except to the extent that there is some sort of trademark um, potential infringement, because we know for those of us who are trademark people, you have a duty to police your trademark at the risk of abandonment. So that, that's the line that Yugo Labs has drawn in terms of enforcing its IP rights can't use their trademarks uh, because they don't want to risk abandonment. And there are over, somebody has actually uh, created a Google sheet for all of the derivatives of the CryptoPunks, nearly 200 CryptoPunks derivatives unauthorized, completely unauthorized, that are allowed to be freely sold. That would be as if Disney allowed 200 derivatives of Mickey Mouse to be sold by other. I mean, it's just preposterous, right? That's never going to happen. But it's happening today in this new, more innovative approach for the digital world. Now, the one thing I, I do want to mention uh, about the, the digital uh, copies and derivative works, it does make some business sense as well. Because as I said before, the NFT is this virtual ownership you know, a new kind of intellectual property. The, cop the digital copies aren't the same thing as the NFT. There's only one unique NFT per character. So the fact that many people may have digital copies of the same character does not undermine the unique NFT. Um, one way to analogize this is uh, a rare Picasso painting if it exists as one singular painting, will not be diminished if people have digital copies of it and are you know, using it online, even if it might be arguably copyright infringement. The value of Picasso might be increased to the extent that, oh my goodness, everybody understands you know, the girl with the mandolin, you know, even that figure. There's so much uh, sort of popular appeal to that artwork. So it's not completely against the business interests of these uh, startup companies to allow this permissiveness with derivative works. Okay, now in terms of thinking about um, where do we go from here uh, in this sort of really, I, I think, uh, age of acceleration with uh, technology, I'd like to also return back to the Italian Renaissance. And even though the Cubist movement or Cubism you know, appended the conventional approach to perspective, of the Italian Renaissance, I think we still can learn a valuable lesson from this time period. As the late art historian Bruce Cole said, writing about the Italian Renaissance, art was not a luxury, but something that society wanted, needed, and used. Consequently, there had to be enough artists to satisfy the considerable demand. 
Now, what if we do the same and take the same approach to valuing artists and stop devaluing their works, stop expecting them to starve, but wanting to see them prosper? Uh, the median salary for independent artists is $30,000 or less. In the United States during the pandemic, that declined to $17,000 a year below the poverty line. What if we changed that and made a priority valuing artists and their works, their ability to sustain themselves in what I call a virtual renaissance? This could be our renaissance now if we change our priority. And this may sound like a radical idea, uh, but I think this is something that would be simply living up to our ideals. The framers in their infinite wisdom recognized copyright and also patents, for those of you who are patent people, copyright and patents have a purpose in this country. It is progress, right? It is progress. And the Supreme Court has been crystal clear on what this means. It's an economic principle of progress that we will encourage individual effort by these creators for personal gain. We want them to make money. And that is the best way to advance public welfare for society, right? Through the talents of these authors. And here is probably the most important line in this Mazur opinion. Sacrificial days devoted to such creative activities deserve not starvation, but rewards commensurate with the services rendered. We need to match what the artists and art provide to society, including all of the health benefits and benefits for civic mindedness to the efforts that these artists are uh, making. $30,000 a year is a complete failure of this economic principle, but we can improve this. And I think what we've seen with NFTs, it already is within our capability to improve it. Now, you may ask yourself, well, how can I improve this? I'm just a law student. I'm just a lawyer. What can I do? Uh, well, let me start out with the simplest thing that you can do. And that is moral support for the artist. The digital artists especially are networking on Twitter and, and Instagram. Uh, to some extent on TikTok, but um, I, I think less so. Uh, and all you really need to do, to the extent that you're on these uh, social media platforms, is to find an artist that you like and just click the like button. That's it. Because we know in our age of algorithms, when you engage with a post, it helps to elevate that post and spread it with further engagement. So here is Laura L's more recent a post, and now she has a lot more followers. Uh, there's a lot of engagement with this one. So the algorithm will feed this to others as well, because that's the way we know like virality happens with social media. It does make a difference. And that's all that I'm simply asking you to consider doing today. Now, some of you are going to become IP attorneys. Uh, some of you are also interested in art, music, et cetera, and want to potentially help out more. One of the really the I think the most fascinating parts about the research I did for the book was that I discovered that the contributions of one or two lawyers were really pivotal to helping modern art succeed, to not be crushed as a degenerate form of art, but to free the minds of creators. Take, for instance, Arthur Aldous. He was a lawyer and a member of the Board of Trustees of the Art Institute. He single-handedly got the approval of this controversial show called The Armory Show, which had already drew controversy in New York City, but he got the Art Institute to accept the exhibition that led to the student protests here. So he, you know, he kind of stuck his neck out, uh, you know, getting the Art Institute to accept this. Uh, and that was crucial because the Art Institute which is amazing, uh, was the first art institution museum in the United States to host modern art in a major exhibition. It is our art institute that did that, that helped to put modern art on the map. 
Then there was John Quinn, another lawyer, a finance lawyer from New York. He was the one who wrote an op-ed in response to the anonymous pamphlet, The God of Ugliness uh, Attack, and he got it published in the New York Times to refute that pamphlet. He was the one who lobbied Congress to repeal a tariff that applied only to modern art on importation of modern art, but not to any other art, classical art, et cetera. It was a penalty on modern art. He got that repealed. He was the one who had the single largest art collection, modern art collection in the United States at one point. Now, I have to tell you also that uh, that wasn't too difficult in the sense that no one was buying modern art. Well, very few were buying modern art. Picasso's works, when they were first shown here, nobody bought them. So just think if you were the, the one who saw some promise in Picasso and bought up his works, I mean, what the value of that would be today. Uh, but that was the time and he saw what he characterized as radium. There was an energy to modern art that did not exist for classical artworks, at least not at that time, because they had been around for you know, hundreds of years, et cetera. He saw the promise. Now, I know we're, we're getting close to the time and uh, it, I wanna leave um, uh, sort of a final, uh, final few thoughts about uh, what I've learned from studying uh, NFTs and also the history of modern art. I know that we live in times where it seems like there are so many problems and it's just like too difficult to solve, right? It's just like, oh my goodness, it's, it's hard to wrap our heads around. And I think that's why, uh, from what the psychologists tell us, uh, you know, Generation Z uh, and um, the millennials uh, have uh, greater doubts about the future. And perhaps that is understandable. Uh, but I'm here to tell you that our problems really are not insurmountable and that no challenge is too big unless we think it is. And I think that's what the lesson uh, of modern art and also with this movement to tokenism tells us. And I believe that the past challenges were way harder than any challenge we face today because we have all these advances uh, that are at our disposal, now including AI. Right, to help tackle these problems. I'll leave you with one final uh, anecdote from history. And I believe history is often a great uh, educator about uh, thinking about current problems. So let's go back to May 30th, 1899, when there was a person in Ohio, and I'm from Ohio, so I love the story, uh, wrote the Smithsonian, hand wrote this letter to the Smithsonian. It said this, I believe that simple flight at least is possible to man and that the experiments and investigations of a large number of independent workers will result in the accumulation of information and knowledge and skill which will finally lead to accomplished flight. Mind you, humans have been trying to fly for hundreds of years. Leonardo da Vinci, even before that. And here's a guy in Ohio who thinks pretty confidently we will accomplish this through flight. And I believe that it is possible, but not only that, I wish to avail myself of all that is already known. And then if possible, add my might to help on the future workers who will attain this final success of human flight. Now, who was this person? Who, who was this person? Well, in the letter, he says, I'm just an enthusiast but not a crank or a crazy person. Yeah, that's what he said. Uh, I'm just an enthusiast. He knew nothing about aviation. That's why he was writing the Smithsonian. He wanted the state of the art so he could learn it and he'd help humans develop this human, what's called then a human flying machine. And it turned out this person was Wilbur Wright, a bicycle store owner who along with his brother, Orville Wright, were the first successful men to build a flying machine that flew for a few seconds in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, but the rest is history. Modern aviation uh, was born from this principle. And what was the solution? The solution was technological. The solution was technological. You know, I, I think it's easy to fear technologies, especially in the day of AI and so like losing control of it 
you know, I think is a legitimate concern, but technology also can be harnessed to do incredible things. The Wrights understood and developed this three axis control system. And for those of you who know aviation, it's the roll, pitch and yaw, three axes, control the plane from turbulence, keep the equilibrium. They understood this principle because they understood how to ride a bike depends on equilibrium. So they applied their knowledge to this human flying machine, from bicycle to human flying machine. And as I said, the rest is history. This still underlies modern aviation principles to this very day, from somebody who knew nothing in 1899, in four years developing this concept, this invention. They also patented it too. And for those of you who are patent people, there were patent litigation related to uh, this patented uh, three axis control system. Now, if the rights could figure out what humans could not figure out for hundreds of years, I think we could at the very least figure out how to devise a system that provides a way for artists to succeed better than our current copyright system. And in the process, we all will benefit by building a better society. These benefits that come from art, I think we will attain with the greater priority given to artists. And really the only limit to solving the problems that we face is our imagination. I think artists have shown that, creators have shown that, and I think the only thing that we need to do is to imagine a better world. Thank you. We have time for some questions. If you're online, please paste the questions in the chat. And I, I have questions. Yes. yes do you think part of the cynicism surrounding NFTs comes from, you have someone like Laura L who has good work, who seems genuine. And then you have something like the Board 8 Yacht Club, which seems kind of, at least from my impression, a bit more cynical and profit focused. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the, in, in the book, I go through the success of the Board 8 Yacht Club. And I think, what they tapped into, uh, which was maybe not as surprising during the pandemic, is this, uh, it was sort of like this, the, the story they tapped into was like crypto wealthy people that had too much money to spend. So they're bored. That, that was like the basic uh, storyline that they developed. And for some reason, when it exploded in 2021, it really generated uh, a lot of uh, popularity. And a so little footnote is that they're also being sued um, for uh, using celebrities to help promote their project. Uh, so there may be some, uh, yes, I think some who view that with skepticism, that aspect of it. And especially if you are skeptical of cryptocurrency, you may not like that story of being so crypto wealthy that uh, you have, you know, you're bored at a bar, et cetera, whatever. Um, but one of the great things about, I think, this space is that it really is decentralized and there's something for everybody, right? Uh, uh, maybe many of us really don't like the projects or are not as interested in the projects, you know, the crypto punks and the board, board apes, and we're more into the art or vice versa, or music. We, we really like the music or the film. Uh, so this is, once we remove the gatekeepers, what to expect is a greater uh, amount of works being created uh, by this uh, NFT uh, being a vehicle for patronage. Other, other questions? Any questions online? Uh, no, I can answer another question. I know that there was a crash a few months ago of the NFT market. Do you think things are going to even out yeah, that's a, that, that's a great question. So in 2021, there was the boom and uh, there's great speculation and everything seemed to be like increasing in value a hundred percent or more. Uh, and then 2022 was the crash, which actually occurred after the financial, other financial markets, including like the stock market and cryptocurrency had crashed. Uh, you know, I think what I would probably, if I had to 
kind of place a bet today would be the view of uh, Gary Vaynerchuk, who had been saying all along, look, 98%, 99% of these projects, the profile picture projects, the cartoon character projects, those are all gonna go to zero. Those are all gonna fail, but the 1% are gonna be historic. The 1% are gonna be like the Amazon. Uh, he analogized it to the dot-com period when you had many businesses, dot-coms fail, but what you had afterwards was you know, the Amazons of the world. And also I think just in general, the concept of e-commerce, right? That concept is, has been proven. I mean, any business that is selling merchandise, it's hard to survive if you don't have an e-commerce component to it. So in the end, many of the projects that had started in 2021 might not recover. Uh, we'll see attrition, but uh, the concept or the model, I think we will see uh, continue. And uh, uh, what will be, I think, fascinating to watch is as kind of like the Disney's of the world, the, the media, the big media companies, whether they start uh, trying to um, use uh, NFTs in ways uh, like the Board 8 uh, Yacht Club in this decentralized co collaboration. Unfortunately, I think this bad economy has really uh, made uh, uh, most businesses very fiscally conservative. So, you know, they're not going to experiment right now. Yes. What's, what's your take on the, like, the race to the bottom for marketplace fees? And, and there's Blair that came into the scene. And do you think there is a place for marketplace to take the fees? And if so, what, what would that fee be in an ideal world? Yeah, so uh, thank you for the question. And obviously you're uh, somewhat familiar with the NFT market. This is one of the things, this so-called race to the bottom is unfortunate, I, I find. And uh, I completed writing my book in December uh, and uh, Blur was just beginning to gain market share. And by 2022, when I'm done with my book, they now have the majority of market share for secondary sales of NFTs. Uh, and just so other people understand what this question is asking, um, Blur is a marketplace that decided to try to attract, uh, they, they were a, a, a latecomer to some extent in marketplaces. At the time, OpenSea ha had the most market share for sales of NFTs on the secondary market. Blur comes in, um, kind of swooping in after a few other startups that had tried to do similar things and decided, we're not gonna charge any marketplace fees for sales. Plus, uh, you don't have to pay creator royalties, resale royalties, which I talked about earlier as one of the things that creators and artists wanted the most out of NFTs. So once you've removed any of those fees, that means the uh, seller can profit more from the sale, right? So it produced this so-called race to the bottom because not surprisingly, I, I had predicted this on my on my website, unfortunately. I wish I were wrong, but I, I called it early and I said, this is a race to the bottom. Um, OpenSea, not surprisingly, changed to exactly the same approach. Um, now, that I think is an unfortunate um, development. Um, there is some, I think, potential promise with, uh, you, they will respect, the marketplaces will respect any contract that has sort of baked into it through their um, tool, filter tools, uh, which marketplaces the NFT cannot be sold on. So they will uh, enforce the full royalty amount uh, that has been requested by the creator. And what some projects from 2021 have done is they have, uh, sort of incentivize their owners to trade in their existing NFT for a new one, and it has a new contract, and then the uh, royalties are in force. So Goblin Town just did that, and they, they caused a lot of stir because uh, some people didn't know what was going on. Um, but they essentially incentivized their owners to re-mint their NFT 
so that they get the technological enforcement of royalties. Uh, as far as what marketplaces you know should charge, you know I, I, I'm agnostic to that. Uh, I'm very strong on respecting the uh, choice of the creators. If they want a resale royalty of typically it's five percent, then that's the term that they are offering their NFT for. And if you don't want that to be a part of the NFT, you don't have to buy it, right? You can buy somebody who is selling it for zero. The CryptoPunks ha have zero royalties. Now, most people can't afford a CryptoPunk, but there are some projects that have you know, zero or, or very, uh, you know, even lower than 5%. Um, so ultimately my position is we should respect creators, their choices as we would respect any business. We don't tell uh, Disney uh, you know, you have to change the royalty that you're charging, et cetera. And there could be negotiations, but once they've set the, the royalty amount that they're seeking, um, you know, that's not something we could unilaterally change, uh, but that's what I think has happened with these marketplaces. Yes. This is uh, kind of off the wall and just a little statement. So you ended uh, by asking how we can help or explaining. So I feel I should just say, you know, coming from the Kent area, walking here, um, there's a really important, I guess, kind of a monument to this way of thinking. That's the warehouse. And it's been in the news that it should be preserved. It might be at risk of demolition, but, you know, you're mentioning remixes and whatnot. And uh, DJ Frankie Knuckles, he was the first Grammy winner for remixes. So something everyone here can do is sign the petition to save the warehouse. That's all. <laughs> Where is the petition? Uh, good question. <laughs> There's a blog so, club article about it. I think someone can find it and post it in the chat. If you Google warehouse in yeah, Chicago. The warehouse, it's on Jefferson Street across from Kent. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, going back to what you were saying, how NFTs were originally supposed to like prevent, like stop gatekeepers. How do you think the conversation can be changed from being more about that than what the initial inclination was and less about again like something like board eight yacht club or companies trying to do nfts and then abandoning it um and like on the, just jumping into another thing like how the metaverse has their own nfts and property how do you think the conversation can be changed to making it more about the artist and less about the high rollers yeah i, I mean i i guess i would uh push back a little bit on whether we need to do that or whether uh, we can support or promote the creators and artists that we believe in. Uh, because I think ultimately in this decentralized approach, um, if there is a significant support for big brands like Nike to continue to do what they're doing, I, I think that's great, right? Because it, it is maximizing the preferences of the market, right? But if there's a failure in the market and not enough people realize that, wait a second, this is doing something tremendous for independent artists, that's where I believe like, for instance, my book and others in the space who are you know, trying to advocate for uh, independent artists um, that's the contribution that I think we can make. Uh, so I, I guess I would say that that's not to the exclusion of Board Ape Yacht Club or Nike or Starbucks. Uh, and there are other uses that don't depend on media. So for instance, there's a airline company in South America that is using NFTs for tickets. And I imagine we're gonna see more of that use of NFTs as tickets. Uh, and I, I think uh, that is, something that we should welcome to the extent it makes things uh, better or more efficient. Uh, and I think one of the virtues that I, I didn't talk about in the talk today that a lot of people like about NFTs is the privacy increasing uh, aspect of it in the sense that to own an NFT, you don't have to reveal your true identity. You don't have to reveal your email. You don't have to give your credit card. You don't have to give your phone number, et cetera, whatever. And part of this response uh, that NFTs are a part of, the so-called Web3, is a response to the big tech companies 
uh, have a lot of your personal data. Uh, so just wanted to point out like this use, the uses of NFTs are manifold. I focused on the ones that I thought uh, this audience would be most interested in hearing. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you so much, everybody. Uh, and feel free to email me if you have any reactions or further questions.